Great day, family. How y'all doing? Good. Well, do yourselves a favor and smile. All right, I, I've been told that as long as you uh, have the opportunity and the ability to, it's all right to smile. And at church, we tell them it don't matter how many teeth you don't have, at least show some of them. All right? Well, let me first of all uh, thank God for my, for my ability to be here. And I'm uh, humbled to uh, stand and, uh, before such a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, Dr. Muse, in his absence, we're humbled and honored. Uh, if y'all would just give him my sentiments uh, that I am pleased to be here again. It's always great to be in his presence. Uh, he's a funny guy, and uh, his wit and his wisdom are priceless. I also want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Levy for always uh, being so welcoming and accommodating uh, for um, the things that we're trying to do, even when we're trying to support here at Hines. And of course, um, Dr. Kane and uh, Mr. Bush, uh, thank you all again. A lot of the things that we attempt to do uh, have everything to do with the fact that we believe that we've been called to this. Uh, in 2006, I'll be brief, y'all. Uh, if you, you want to clock me, you can do that. Uh, about 7.5 minutes, put, uh, go on and put me on your phone. I'll be done. But 2006, uh, January to be precise, um, my baby girl, we get a, get a phone call uh, from my wife and my mother-in-law who were at uh, the um, mall out there in that other town that we don't name. And get a call and my wife says, we're getting ready to take Sweetie, that's what we call her, Sweetie, her, her, her name is Tony Michelle. We're gonna take Tony, uh, Tony, take Sweetie to the hospital. She'd been having issues with her stomach. We thought that she was bloated, had been giving her the drops and all those other things. Get a phone call after about four hours of my wife being there. And she says, you need to come to the hospital right now. Uh, I said, well, tell me what's wrong. She said, I ain't going to tell you what's wrong. Just come on to the hospital right now. So I get to the hospital. We get in this room where they have uh, pictures of my baby's stomach pulled up. And inside of my eight-month-old baby girl's stomach is a ball about this big. That Monday, they do emergency surgery to remove uh, what we then knew was a tumor. That Thursday, I get a phone call while I was an assistant principal at Terry High School that my baby girl had cancer. Blew me away because here I am, a faith man, a, a brother that believes in God, believes in everything, and on my way to the hospital, I remember saying to God on Interstate 55, I said, God, I don't know what to say to you right now. I said, I don't know how to talk to you. I said, now for everybody else, I can believe you for them. I can believe you for the lady at church. I can believe you for the guy down the street. But I don't know what's going to happen with my baby girl. Pastor, I was having problems struggling to believe that God could do for me what I believed him to do for everybody else. I don't know who I'm talking to, but at least five of y'all in this room have been in a place where you didn't know whether or not you could believe God for what you needed to believe him for. And so... Uh, we trusted God. He delivered. My baby girl is now 12 years old, almost 12 years old in May, and she gets on my nerves. <laughs> but something happened to me. Something happened to me uh, in between uh, that January and the end of February in 2006. And there are five things that I believe that were important that happened to me that I want to share with you that I think uh, that if you don't, that you have to do these five things before you die. That if you don't do these five things before you die, you have only survived and you have not lived. The word, the word life, uh, uh, there is a, another word for life um, that is added on to it. It's called Zoe. It's called the Zoe kind of life. It is the highest kind of living. It's that living when you high on the hog. It's that living when you don't worry about uh, not having cab fare to the welfare. It's, it's, that, it's that living where you ain't worried about your ends not meeting. It's, it's that kind of living where you're not worried about what folk think, say, or talk about. It is the Zoe kind of life. And I said, God, I want the Zoe kind of life. So there are five things that I adopted that I believe you need to adopt. And in my last four minutes, I believe that the first thing that you got to do is you got to figure out why you're here. There is nothing more frustrating than not knowing why you've been placed in this place to call earth. There is nothing more frustrating than not knowing why God decided to breathe the breath of life into you. All of the people, all of the folk that didn't make it and you did. Here it is, uh, of, of all of the things biologically that could have gone wrong, out of all the things that could have happened between a zero and two pastor, but God saw fit that you still be here. Why are you still here? 
If you don't figure out why it is that the bullet didn't hit you when it should have, if you don't figure out why it is that the diagnosis didn't come back positive, but it came back negative when it should have, if you don't figure out why it is that the car stayed on the road when you went to sleep and don't know how you made it home, ain't nobody saying nothing about when you left the club and then that's all right. <laughs> but you gotta figure out why am I still here? The second thing that I think that is, is, is um, vitally important is that you have to get free from they. Y'all don't know who they are? Me either, actually. Uh, but they say, uh, they say that Jackson, Mississippi is the most dangerous place in the world. Uh, but what they won't do is stop watching the news and start reading the real statistics that'll tell you that for, the, that, that for two years in a row, we've reduced our crime while Madison and everybody else's is going up. But they just don't show you that on TV. What they say is that all of the businesses are leaving Jackson, but what they won't tell you is that in Hines County, our tax, our tax income went up while the other counties around us went down. You didn't know that because you were listening today. What they said is that unemployment in Jackson is at an all-time high, but what they won't tell you is that from 2014 until now, that we have reduced our unemployment rate from 70% to 4.9% lower than the state of Mississippi's average. But that's what they said, and that's what you probably believe. So you got to get free from they, free from what they say, free from what they think, free from what they know. I realized in January of 2006 that if I worried about they, I would never become me. So why don't you look at somebody and say, forget they, and find you. The third thing that I realized that was vitally important that I had to do if I was going to live and that I had not lived appropriately yet was I had to pick a side. What do you mean, Tony? What do you mean pick a side? Dr. King said that uh, if, if you haven't decided on what you would stand for, you would probably fall for anything. See, there's too many folk out there scared to make people mad. There's too many folk scared to offend folk. Well, I don't want to make nobody mad. Well, you got to make somebody mad. <laughs> and if somebody ain't mad with you, it's probably because you hadn't done, you hadn't picked the side yet. When you pick a side, you automatically make folk mad. Let me tell you what happened to me. I, 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 didn't, I didn't expect this uh, because it wasn't in me. I ain't know. When I became mayor, I automatically inherited about, uh, let's see, it's 173,000 people in Jackson. So I inherited about uh, 79,000 people that didn't like me overnight. Didn't even know. I had never been the bad guy. I ain't know what I do to you. Never met you before. But I realized it's because I picked a side. We picked a side and we told the state of Mississippi, I'm not sending police officers to that fair anymore. And you're not sending us a check. I told them we picked a side. And when we picked a side, all kind of folks started not liking me. Well, we didn't think that you would, uh, we didn't think that you would come against us this way. Well, I didn't think that you would treat us like we were nobody in Jackson either. You've got to pick a side. You got to stand for something. You got to stand for your children. If you got children, you got to stand for your children. You got to demand that they receive not an adequate education, but that they receive an excellent education. If you have a three-year-old and a four-year-old and they're in a daycare and all they're doing is getting babysat, you're in the wrong place. And you got to stand for your child to be sure that when they walk in that five-year-old classroom that they have the skills that they need to be able to read. You got to stand for something, family. The fourth thing as I hurry up and get done is that you got to understand that uh, I got this as a, as a book that I read a lot. And in this book, Pastor talks me with, uh, in this book, this book uh, talks about this guy named Peter who was in a boat. He's in a boat. He looks uh, out from the boat during a, a tempest and there is a man named Jesus. And he says, Lord, if it's you, Allow me to come. Jesus says, come on out. The brother gets out of the boat, gets on the water, walks towards where Jesus is. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to challenge you, get out of the boat. 
Your biggest challenge in living life and living it to the fullest is leaving folk on the boat that have always either encouraged you to stay on the boat or haven't encouraged you to get out. You got to get out of the boat. It's not until you get out of the boat that you really realize what's really on the inside of you. You know, you're only as great as the obstacles you overcome. See, everybody's got a story, and we don't have time to hear all of your story. The best way that you let us know your story is by showing us the amazing glory that comes through you persevering and not giving up. You've got to get out of the boat. What you'll find is that when you get out of the boat, you really pick the side then. Because when you get out of the boat, then folk going to ask you, well, well why, why did you leave us in the boat? You ain't real no more. You didn't change. You doggone right I changed. Yeah, I changed because on the boat, I settled for just having enough. On the boat, I settled for just being around people that didn't want the things for me that I should have wanted for myself. Yeah, I changed. What about you? You can't be so afraid of stepping out of the boat that you're going to leave something that God never created to be assigned to you in the first place. So you got to step out of the boat. And finally, and I'm out of here. <laughs> If you've done all of that and you stepped out of the boat, you got to be sure that you matter. What do you mean, Tony? Uh, I mean that at the end of the day, that if nobody misses you when you're gone, you didn't matter. At the end of the day, if your Old Testament teacher was glad to see you leave, you didn't matter. If at the end of the day, the whole neighborhood did a petition to get you to move out, you didn't matter. But if a little boy can't wait to see you walk through the door, daddy, you matter. If a little girl can't wait to see her mama so she can be just like her for all the right reasons, then guess what, mama? You matter. If a community is better because you were in the world and you figured out why you were here, you decided that you weren't going to be influenced or care about what they said, you clearly understood that God put you here for a reason and that you weren't going to stay on the boat, then you mattered. So what you going to do? You going to wait for somebody to validate what God put on the inside of you? What you going to do? You going to wait? Until something bad happens and then you ain't got no other choice but to submit and do what you were called to do, what you gonna do? You gonna wait till somebody else do it? What are you gonna do? Because the world is waiting on you. The world is waiting on you. Your block is waiting on you. I live at 1605 Dorgan Street in South Jackson. When I first moved there in 2001, between 2001 and 2006, we were averaging 52 house burglaries a, a month in my, a week rather, in my neighborhood. Let me count it for you, 52 house burglaries a week in my neighborhood. In 2006, in uh, 2005, that December, two guys tried to break in my house. I got into a fight with one of them. It didn't go well for him. But the point is, is that you have to matter. When knocked on the door, there's four people in my neighborhood on the block that I live on. Knocked on the door, I said, man, we gotta do something. We, we, it's, it's crazy around here. Uh, the police can't be everywhere at one time. I don't even remember. I think Frank was the mayor at the time. I said, Frank can't do it all. He can't be everywhere. We got to do something. And we decided in our neighborhood, our neighborhood, you hear what I said? Our neighborhood, that we were going to matter. And so you couldn't stand on the corner of Dewey and Flowers Drive and not have somewhere to go. Because Mr. Lee was going to walk outside. He about this tall. Mr. Lee going to walk outside. He ain't got no teeth in the top. And Miss Lee was going to come outside and say, hey, what y'all doing out here? <laughs> hey, hey, what y'all doing now? We don't do that out here on uh, them dogging and, and flowers. <laughs> and then Mr. James with him. Mr. James don't say nothing. Mr. James doesn't look mean. He just walk outside and stand like this. Then there's a fella that stays across the street. He don't ever talk to us. He's a Caucasian brother. He don't ever talk to anybody in the neighborhood. But you better believe when he starts seeing folks come outside trying to do something, he's coming out there like this in his, in his house road. Because everybody matters. If this city is going to thrive, what y'all doing in these classrooms every day, it matters. If, these cities are gonna, if this city is going to work and it's going to make it, you got to be intentional about what you do when you walk inside these halls, these hallowed halls, 
and being determined that you're going to be the one that made it. I know I'm going over my time, but y'all got to hear my heart. You got to hear my heart. And this is whether I'm Tony or the mayor. Because see, at the end of the day, the mayor don't make the city go round. You do. I'll say this. I think one of the worst things, and well, let me, let me, let me give you a caveat. I think that uh, we had the greatest opportunity the last eight years when President Barack Obama was in office. But I think one of the things that we did not do well was we did not participate because we believed we had a savior. And we sat at home and watched the news and waited to see what he was going to change next. Rather than us getting out and seeing that change happen to itself. Or seeing that that change happened because of us. What I'm challenging you to do is get off the boat. Get off the couch. Get off of the lake called apathy. Walk into what you've been called to walk in. And I guarantee you, they won't be able to say anything that will deter you from achieving what you've been called to achieve. There's a poem I recite every time I get an opportunity to speak. It's an opportunity that helps us to understand the magnitude of the moment. And the magnitude of this moment is found in Dr. Benjamin E. May's poem called God's Minute. And it helps you to understand the magic that's in this current moment right now. All of your attention has been arrested and all of you are sitting, thinking, and contemplating how will you matter. And some of you have already dismissed the, fact, dismissed the fact that you can matter because either you don't have the money that you think you ought to have, or you don't have the right education, or you ain't got the right family, or you ain't got the right something. But Dr. May says it this way. He says, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it is up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give it a count if I abuse it. He says, it's just a tiny minute, but eternity is in it. God bless y'all.